At about 10 a.m. on the morning of July 18, 1997, a man named Alfred Flatten was driving down a rural section of highway in Douglas County, Wisconsin. He was a few miles east of the town of Dairyland and was just about to pass an intersection up ahead when he noticed something out of the corner of one of his eyes, about 40 to 50 yards down what was supposed to be a dead-end road he could just make out what appeared to be some kind of figure. On a hunch, he decided to investigate and pulled over so that he could take a closer look. Upon walking off the highway, Flatten realized that what he had spotted was a man lying off to one side of the dead-end road. He might have been easy to miss if it weren't for his white clothing, which stood out against the gravel and dirt of the rural road, as well as the greenery that lined both it and the highway. Flatten's first thought was that this unknown man had passed out due to the summer heat. However, that quickly changed when he made a startling discovery. There was blood all over the front of the man's shirt, and he wasn't breathing at all. While it was immediately clear to the detectives who responded a short time later that this was a crime scene, none were prepared for what would happen next. Though they didn't know it yet, they were about to delve into one of the strangest and most twisted rabbit holes of their entire careers. After being alerted about the suspected crime scene, detectives with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office quickly got to work analyzing the area and searching for evidence. The first order of business was taking a closer look at the dead man to see what could be learned. The victim was a Caucasian male who appeared to be in his mid to late 40s. Though an autopsy would be needed to confirm, his cause of death seemed obvious. There was a single injury to his chest that was consistent with a close contact gunshot wound, and a 44 caliber shell casing was recovered not too far from the body. Based on the amount of blood at the scene, detectives concluded that this was where the shooting had taken place. No murder weapon was found, but tire tracks and at least two sets of distinct footprints revealed that the victim had likely been driven out to the remote location by his attacker or attackers. It appeared that he had walked with the killer to the place where he had been shot. This stuck out as strange to investigators. Why would someone go to the trouble of driving all the way out to this remote location to commit the murder, only to make no attempt to try and hide the body of the victim? Something else that immediately caught the attention of detectives was the man's strange choice of clothing. It turned out that his shirt wasn't the only thing that was white. His entire outfit, from his pants to his shoes to his belt, also was as well. Investigators barely had time to consider the odd attire, though, before they came across their first major lead. In one of the man's pockets was a passport. The photo inside was a match to the victim. His name was Mark Stephen Foster. As authorities would soon learn, Mark had been reported missing only a few hours before his body had been discovered. The thing was, though, that report had come from across the state line in Minnesota, more than a hundred miles away from where his body had been found. After Douglas County investigators collected all apparent evidence from the crime scene, Mark Foster's body was sent off for an autopsy. In the meantime, detectives began digging deeper into his life. Authorities learned that Mark was 45 years old and lived in Minneapolis. He was the father of several children and had been married a number of times, most recently, just a few months ago. He had also had quite the interesting career. Though technically a pharmacist by trade, Mark had made a fortune in the burgeoning technology industry through a company he had started in the late 1980s called Quanta Press. Specifically, Mark had been a pioneer of bringing CD-ROM-based content and software to the masses. While even saying the acronym CD-ROM feels silly these days, back then it was still very much an emerging technology one with a potential mark had seemingly been among the first to recognize. According to reports we came across, when Mark Foster started Quanta Press, his company was one of just four total businesses producing CD-ROMs in the entire United States. 
a group which included Microsoft. He was brushing shoulders professionally with the likes of Bill Gates, had a profile written about him in the Chicago Tribune, and by the early 1990s was bringing in millions of dollars. In 1993, he even got the chance to do a demo of the technology for then-Vice President Al Gore, something that detectives realized when they stumbled across a photo of the two of them together. Another reason underlying Mark's business success seemed to be his charisma and magnetic personality. He had diverse interests, could effortlessly draw people in, and had an intoxicating visionary quality about him. Again, while the archetype of the eccentric tech CEO is played out to the point of cliché these days, suffice it to say, it was a lot more novel during this era, and it looked as though Mark Foster could really be going places. How was it then, detectives wondered, that just four years after sitting down with the vice president, Mark Foster had ended up dead at the side of a dirt road in rural Wisconsin. Perhaps, they speculated, this was a kidnapping, and the motive had been financial. While this became the first theory of the case, it wasn't long before a whole new strange dimension was added to the investigation, when detectives received a call from the medical examiner's office. They had found something during Mark's autopsy that they said authorities needed to take a look at. When Douglas County investigators received word about a mysterious development in the Mark Foster case, they quickly headed to the medical examiner's office to learn more. Little did they know they were about to get their hands on the most bizarre lead they had encountered yet. The M.E. explained to detectives that while preparing for the autopsy, they had been in the process of removing Mark's bizarre all-white outfit when something fell out of one of his shoes. It turned out to be a small scrap of paper with a short message scribbled on both sides. The front of the note read, quote, Jack Fraser isn't here, but it's Jimmy Bailey, or look-alike. It continued on the back, quote, Geez, it's three toughs. Hope I'm okay. Understandably, investigators were perplexed by the note. Did Mark write it? If so, when? And was it supposed to be a clue to what had happened to him? Obviously, the names Jack Fraser and Jimmy Bailey were the most concrete pieces of information included in the short message. The names didn't mean anything to authorities, but perhaps they would to those closest to Mark. Shortly after the cryptic note was discovered, detectives traveled to Mark's home in Minneapolis. It was here that they met the 45-year-old's wife, Sarah Phillips Foster, his nephew, Brent Thompson, and a family friend who also lived with them named Greg Friesner. While all three were emotional upon learning about Mark's death, as part of their due diligence, investigators had to consider the possibility that they might have been involved. Of particular interest to detectives were Sarah and Brent. It turned out that Sarah and Mark's relationship had moved incredibly quickly. They had only met six months ago, but already were married and expecting a baby. Perhaps Sarah had gotten close to Mark for his money and had planned to kill Mark to benefit from his death. Then there was Brent, Mark's nephew, who had been the one who had called police to file the missing persons report. What stuck out to detectives was how quick he had been to contact police. Brent said he had last spoken to his uncle at around 2 to 2.30 a.m. on July 18th. By the time Mark's body was found roughly eight hours later, Brent had already reported him missing. It was almost like he knew that something had happened. When questioned about this, though, Brent said that he was worried that his uncle was in danger. Moreover, he wasn't the only one. He said that he, Sarah, and Greg had all agreed to report Mark missing that morning after he failed to return home from a meeting with someone earlier that night. That person's name was Jack Fraser. Needless to say, when Brent, Sarah, and Greg brought up the name Jack Fraser, investigators were immediately intrigued, especially when they learned that he seemed to have a motive for murder. The group explained that Jack was Sarah's ex-boyfriend and that the two of them had been together for years, right up until six months ago when she met Mark 
Sarah claimed that while things hadn't been good between her and Jack for a while, he had become incredibly jealous when she left, especially when he found out that she had married Mark shortly afterwards. She said that Jack had refused to accept that she had moved on, and disconcertingly, had even threatened Mark on a couple of occasions. Brent, Sarah, and Greg said these seemed like credible threats, describing Jack as a biker who was connected to people in outlaw motorcycle gangs. Worried about what he was capable of, Mark had decided he needed to try and sit down one-on-one -on -one with Jack to try and clear the air, and had arranged the meeting with him on the night of his murder. When police spoke to other people who knew Mark, it wasn't long before Jack Fraser's name came up once again. Several people, including a few of the dead man's friends and one of his ex-wives, said that Mark had spoken to them about his plans to meet with Jack. One in particular said that Mark seemed apprehensive and worried when they talked on the phone, saying that Jack had gone as far as to threaten to kill him. The friend had advised Mark not to go through with the meeting, but he said that it was something that he had to do. Not long after, police uncovered another unsettling piece of information. It turned out that Jack owned a piece of property not too far away from where Mark's body was found. Suddenly, the location of their crime scene seemed to make a lot more sense. And with that, authorities turned their attention to finding Jack Fraser. Luckily, Jack wasn't too hard to locate and agreed to sit down for an interview with detectives a couple of days into the investigation. Much to their surprise, Jack didn't try to deny that he had problems with Mark and Sarah, and instead told them he knew that when he read about Mark's murder in the papers, it would only be a matter of time before they came looking for him. However, he claimed that police had it all wrong. For starters, Jack said he definitely wasn't a murderer. Besides, if he was mad at anyone, it was Sarah, not Mark. After all, she had been the one that had dumped him, and in an incredibly cruel way at that. Jack stated that they had been together for four years, during which time he had taken care of her and her two kids from a previous relationship. Even though he was away for work a lot as a long-haul truck driver, he had been under the impression that they had a great life together. Up until he got home from his normal route six months earlier and found that Sarah had secretly moved out. As for Jack's so-called biker gang ties, he said that was a complete fabrication. He was just a normal guy who happened to like motorcycles. Most importantly of all, though, Jack said he had never met with Mark on the night of his murder, nor had any discussion between them to meet ever taken place. To this end, Jack had an ironclad alibi. He was working on the night that Mark had been killed. He had just completed a trucking route out to the east coast of the country and had caught a flight home afterwards. He was still on the plane at the time the crime took place. Jack was able to provide flight information, baggage receipts, and a detailed itinerary from his company accounting for his whereabouts for days leading up to Mark's death. With Jack's alibi proving that he could not possibly have been the one that killed Mark Foster, Detectives decided to look into the second name mentioned in the dead man's cryptic note, Jimmy Bailey. As it happened, Jack knew Jimmy Bailey, who it turned out was also another one of Sarah's exes. The pair had previously been married, and Jimmy was the father of one of her children. According to Jack, things were extremely contentious between Jimmy, Mark, and Sarah. After a little more digging, authorities learned that not long ago, Jimmy had actually been embroiled in a custody battle with Sarah. The fighting had gotten extremely bitter between them, especially when Mark had entered the picture and a judge ruled that the kids should stay with him and Sarah. Things had reportedly escalated further when after this hearing, Jimmy instigated a shoving match in the parking lot with Mark. Once again, it seemed detectives had uncovered a credible motive for murder. Unfortunately, just like with Jack, when police looked into Jimmy Bailey's whereabouts on the night of Mark's murder, they learned that he also had a solid alibi. He, too, had been at work. With both men seemingly ruled out as suspects, detectives were beginning to believe that the cryptic note found with Mark Foster's body had been a red herring. Someone was trying to frame Jack Fraser and Jimmy Bailey for the crime. But who? Who? 
and for what reason. With their most promising clue now looking like it had been deliberately planted to mislead them, Douglas County detectives were forced to reevaluate everything that they thought they knew about the investigation so far. At first, the more they did this, the less the case seemed to make sense. That was, until they noticed something that they had missed. They realized that during their initial discussion with Brent, Sarah, and Greg, they had never actually told them how Mark had died. And bizarrely, they had never asked. This was despite the fact that they were apparently so concerned for Mark's safety that Brent had called police just hours after they claimed he went to meet with Jack Fraser. Something wasn't adding up. Around this same time, investigators started to get additional bits of information that further sent their suspicions in this direction. They began to hear rumors about strange things that allegedly went on in Mark and Sarah's house, to the point that some said they were concerned for Sarah's children. Detectives were told that Mark was intimately involved with many different romantic partners, and so were Sarah, Brent, and Greg. In fact, everyone in the house was sleeping with each other, something that Sarah, Brent, and Greg had never mentioned during previous questioning. With all of these different dynamics at play, authorities began to speculate that perhaps someone in the house had gotten jealous, enough so that they had been driven to murder. Hoping to uncover more, detectives were able to obtain a search warrant for Mark and Sarah's house. On July 29th, 11 days after Mark's death, police executed the warrant at the property. Immediately upon entering, they encountered a large amount of adult movies, magazines, and other, let's just say, adult-related items. However, it was when investigators went up into the home's attic that they encountered something they were truly unprepared for. The space was painted with fluorescent glow-in-the-dark paint, and blood-like substances had been spread out all over the walls and floors. The main attraction, so to speak, though, was a large altar littered with candles and other items. Chillingly, among these were business cards that detectives had given to Sarah, Brent, and Greg during their first meeting. It was clear that this was some kind of ritual room, and that investigators themselves had seemingly become targets. Needless to say, Douglas County detectives were stunned by what they found in the attic of Mark's home. However, there were still many more revelations to come. Upon further investigation, they learned that Mark had been fascinated with anything to do with the occult, particularly magic and voodoo. Specifically, he had been a follower of Santeria, a religion that was developed in Cuba in the 19th century and which combines elements of several West African spiritual practices with Roman Catholicism. In Santeria, practitioners believe that deities can be appealed to through sacrifices to provide things such as success, protection, and spiritual guidance. However, they must be accessed through a priest who runs a given home or temple. It turned out that Mark Foster considered himself such a priest. How much he adhered to actual Santeria and how much he just made up or borrowed from other occult practices is unclear. Though what was clear was that everyone else living in the home had been one of Mark's followers. They weren't the only ones either. There was an extended group that sources say may have included up to a dozen people who all considered Mark to be their priest. Detectives discovered that Mark recruited these followers mostly at a local occult bookstore where he liked to hang out. He would lure in people preferably those in their early 20s who were looking for guidance and direction, and tell them that Santeria and Voodoo were how he had achieved all of his business success. Once an individual had been brought in, they would be initiated by taking drugs and sleeping with Mark and the other followers. Greg Friesner had actually been the first person that Mark had recruited this way. The more that detectives delved into Mark's spiritual beliefs, the more things seemed to make sense. For instance, the all-white clothing he had been found in at the time of his death was consistent with the attire that would have been worn by a Santerian priest. There was one belief, though, 
that stuck out to investigators more than any other. Mark had apparently spoken at length to his followers about transferring the consciousness of one individual into another. Not only did Mark claim that this was possible, he said that he himself had done it. The only catch, though, was that the person whose consciousness was being transferred had to die. Mark said that he had learned the technique in New Orleans, where he had absorbed the consciousness of a master priest by killing him in a graveyard, thus absorbing his powers. Understandably worried that Mark had committed an actual murder, authorities looked into his claim about the graveyard. It turned out to be complete nonsense. However, it was clear that Mark's followers hadn't taken it that way. That's when detectives came up with a new theory. Perhaps Greg Friesner, who was Mark's second-in-command and his most devout follower, had killed his master, believing that doing so would allow him to gain his powers and take over as leader. It seemed to make sense. The question now was, could detectives prove it? Knowing that they would need more than a wild story if they were going to be able to make an arrest, Douglas County investigators began looking for any kind of solid evidence that could tie Greg Friesner to Mark Foster's murder. Eventually, they came across a tip that seemed promising, when one of Mark's adult children told detectives that his father had a rifle, which he kept at a local storage facility. The gun was a 44 caliber, the same kind that had been used to kill him. Believing that this was the murder weapon, authorities got a warrant to search Mark's storage unit. However, when they looked inside, the gun was missing. They soon discovered why. Surveillance footage revealed that on the day before the murder, someone had come by and removed something from the unit, which they had carried inside of a large duffel bag. Investigators were sure that this was the rifle, but this wasn't really what caught their attention. You see, the person who picked up the weapon wasn't Greg Friesner. It was Mark Foster. At first, detectives were confused, but when they started looking closer, the final pieces of the puzzle began falling into place. It turned out that prior to Mark's death, his entire life was a giant house of cards, one which he knew was soon going to come tumbling down. While Mark had indeed been on the cutting edge of the computer industry at one point, after his first taste of wealth, he had become more focused on riding the high than ensuring the long-term success of his business. As money poured in, he lived lavishly, using his company as a personal checking account without reinvesting or keeping up with the changing landscape. As the CD-ROM gold rush started to slow down, Mark acted as if nothing had changed. He borrowed increasingly large sums of money from people he knew, money which he was able to secure thanks to his charisma, and which he ironically used to sell people on the idea that he was still a success. Though Mark had eventually closed down Quanta Press and had gone back to work as a pharmacist before his death, he still had these outstanding debts. On top of this, he owed huge sums of money from the business in back taxes. The whole time, he was getting deeper and deeper into his occult practices, until he finally felt he had found an answer. Mark's plan became clear to detectives when they learned that he had taken out roughly $500,000 worth of life insurance coverage on himself in the months leading up to his death. Among the major beneficiaries were Sarah, Brent, and Greg. The thing was, in order for the policies to pay out, Mark would need to make it look like he had been murdered. Now, ordinarily, this wouldn't be ideal, but for Mark, it was no problem. Since he believed that his consciousness would be transferred so long as one of his followers was the one who carried out the killing, he was willing to go through with it. For him, it was perfect. He could get himself out of trouble, benefit his friends and family members financially, and of course, frame two people that he didn't like for the crime. Jack Fraser, and Jimmy Bailey. All along, it had been Mark Foster who had orchestrated the entire thing. All that being said, once again, detectives were in a tough spot. They had finally put everything together, but they had no hard evidence. 
about a year and a half would pass before authorities would get a lucky break. It happened when Brent Thompson walked into the Douglas County Sheriff's Office and said he was ready to confess. The guilt had been eating him up inside, and he didn't want to live like this anymore. Brent told detectives that their final theory had been correct. Mark had planned his own killing, and he and Greg had helped. On the night of the murder, the three of them had driven out to the place that they had chosen specifically because it was close to a property they knew the Jack Fraser owned. After performing a ritual, Mark took out his rifle, gave it to Greg, and instructed him to shoot him in the heart. The gun had actually failed to go off a couple of times, but in a disturbing testament to the conviction of his beliefs, Brent described how Mark had figured out the issue and then totally unfazed, had handed the gun back to Greg and talked him through everything. After the shooting, he said that on the way home, they had gotten rid of their clothes and thrown the rifle in a nearby river. From that point on, the two of them and Sarah had done their best to misdirect the investigation. Following this statement, detectives went to Greg Friesner to confront him. He initially denied taking part, but when police told him about Brent's confession, he reportedly admitted to everything as well. Both men subsequently pleaded guilty in connection with Mark's death, with Greg receiving 20 years for second-degree intentional homicide and Brent receiving three years for being a party to second-degree homicide and obstructing the investigation. Sarah, meanwhile, was never charged in connection with the case because detectives failed to adequately link her to the scheme. According to the most up-to-date information we could find, Brent was paroled in 2004, while Greg was paroled in 2020. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.